Okay. Welcome. Welcome. This is Marcy. Welcome to What's Up Marcy. I'm Marcy Brockman. Nice of you to join me. Um, I didn't give any notice this time I went live, just uh, spur of the moment to uh, talk about, to do our book, book Talk Sunday and to talk about uh, The Crucible today by Arthur Miller. Um, normally I do more current, uh, modern fiction and nonfiction. A loud car just went by. Um, but this time, I guess because school has just started here in New York, just this past Thursday, I met with students again for the first time in six months. And uh, don't even get me started as to how that's going. Because I, I, I could talk for an hour about what I think about what's going on. But um, since it doesn't make sense to get upset or anxious about things that we can't control, I am trying to be zen about the whole thing and control only what I can control. Um, but I have been teaching for 25 years and I think 26 years if you count my student teaching um, internship, but I have been teaching the crucible for almost every single year that I have been teaching. Um, and it, it's a play that I have seen performed in a regular proscenium theater. I have seen performed in the round. I have seen a variety of movie adaptations and I have read it in class with students for most of my adult life for 25 years, quarter of a century. And it is the themes that Arthur Miller was grappling with during the play that he wrote in the 1950s as a metaphor for McCarthyism and the um, Un-American Activities Commission that Senator McCarthy um, had headed, headed, uh, led, I guess, um, and and that caused Arthur Miller and a variety, a very long list of other Hollywood. Uh, celebrities to be blacklisted and so on because of their um, potential liaisons or connections with uh, communism. And, and the same themes of fear and uh, reputation and disloyalty and suspicion that ran McCarthyism was also very prevalent at, at, during the Salem witch trials of the 1620s in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, as a side note, my daughter is in college in Beverly, Mass right now, um, which is only three and a half miles from Salem. And she's taking a Salem witch trials literature course in school this semester. So I can't wait to find out what she learns there that I don't know or haven't heard before. Um, so the play, so the, the play, here's a, a, a book cover, one of the book covers of, of the play itself, um, depicting what we can only guess is Abigail Williams and, uh, our protagonist or antagonist and, um, Reverend Paris, her uncle and, um, John Proctor, her married lover slash boss. Here's another book cover try to do this so that you can see it without the glare. Um, here's another one. It shows like the hand with the, the puppets as she worked the town. Here's another one. Uh, and there was a movie adaptation, quite a few movie, movie adaptations, but this one was with Daniel Day-Lewis and Winona Ryder. It was made in the 1990s and it, it is absolutely flawless. It's perfectly done. Um, and I show you another movie poster for the, the, the movie. Um, and I, I show it to my students every year because seeing a play is so much more impressive and so much more, um, so it hits so much more of your emotions and touches so many more of your hearts, your heartstrings, uh, and, and your humanity more than just reading a play. I mean, a play, Arthur Miller didn't write this play for it to be read in a classroom. He wrote it to be performed on a stage. So to see it performed is, uh, is amazing. Um, when I start out teaching this play, I ask my students, 
some very basic, elemental, existential, sort of essential questions to get them thinking about the themes of this play and how they might react in certain situations um, before we even get to the content. So I ask them, um, would you confess to doing something that you didn't do if it meant that it would save your life? So if somebody was going to accuse you of some heinous crime and by confessing to it, you might do some jail time, but they wouldn't kill you. Would you confess to it even if you didn't do it? And if you didn't confess, they were gonna put you to death. Would you confess to doing something that you didn't do to save a life of a stranger or the life of a friend or the life of a family member? Uh, would you blame someone else, turn it around a little bit, would you blame someone else for something to get yourself out of trouble or out of serving jail time or out of certain death? And you can think of different scenarios um, uh, basically getting at the, the ethics of the person I'm asking the questions to. Um, would you follow orders? Let's say you were a police officer or you were in the military. Would you follow orders and do your job even if you felt that what your job was was morally wrong? So like in this play, we've got the, the, the town constable or sheriff um, and he's arresting people who have been accused for witchcraft and bringing them in to stand to testify in court or to um, stand against charges in court or to serve jail time even though he's not sure um, if the person is guilty oh here there's someone here Amy Marshall Furman acted in this play yay what role did you play Amy I'd love to know that's very cool it's very cool I would love to be in this play actually um, so what would you do? You know, like, would, would you, would you follow orders? Could you have been an SS officer in the Nazi army and not have believed in the cause that was leading six million Jews to deaths in gas chambers? Like, would you have had the moral temerity to stand up against tyranny, even if it meant that you would lose your life? or that you would in some way be negatively affected, would you stand up for the right, the, the cause of the, of the right side? Um, you know, it's really difficult. You can apply these sort of scenarios to an almost an unlimited amount of, of situations since humanity, humans have been doing this to ourselves and each other forever. Um, would you forgive your spouse for infidelity? If we bring it home, it'll make it a little bit more personal now. You know, if you found out that your husband or wife was sleeping with the babysitter, um, would you have a problem with that? Um, would you let that continue and let your marriage continue? Oh, here, Amy, Mary Warren. Oh, she's a good character to play. Watches everything from the outside and then realizes what's going on with the girls and, um, and tries to do the right thing and tell the truth. Yeah, okay. So so here, let's see if I can encapsulate the, the, the play in a very short summary. So so the play opens and we have this little backstory that Abigail Williams, who's 17, had been having uh, an ongoing torrid affair with her boss, John Proctor, the 35-year-old gorgeous, um, very sexy farmer who he works for. Um, his wife... Um, uh, had been quite ill after the birth of their last child. They have three sons. And he sort of turned to this lovely, able-bodied 17-year-old who worked for him. And then after a while of, you know, having her in the barn kind of thing, um, his wife got suspicious and fired her and threw her out. Um, she happens to be the nephew, the orphaned nephew of the town's uh, preacher the town's reverend, uh, Paris, who is uh, very shallow and very selfish and only thinks of his own reputation, etc. cetera. Um, the Puritans themselves lived such a protracted, closed off, prim, religious, 
like scared of their own shadow and scared of nature, scared of everything that wasn't devout and reverent in their in their world. Um, and the young teenage girls, which there were an abundance of in this small community, were um, feeling like they had no power and because they didn't and they were feeling unseen because they were. And so they were meeting in the middle of the night, which they were not allowed to do in the woods where they were not allowed to be. And with the help of Reverend Paris's slave from Barbados, Tichuba, they lit a fire with a cauldron and frogs and all sorts of weird things that should go in there. And they had these little incantations and they did these dances and they wished for you know, very juvenile little things like, I hope that George Poole, my love, will love me back. And, you know, like all these little innocent things, all they're really wishing for is for love in their lives. And Abigail wishes for his, uh, her former lover's wife to die, that she wants John Proctor for herself. And in order to have him, his wife has to disappear. Um, and she takes it to a totally different level. And we can only guess um, the, the, the outlandish things that, that she does. Um, the movie does a really good job at sort of depicting, depicting that. And, and there's like a chicken that she sacrifices at this little fire in the woods and she drinks the chicken blood. It's like this very heinous, like it would be shocking for us now in 2020, let alone 400 years ago. So the next morning is when the play opens up. And the next morning we find out that um, two of the girls in town, Reverend Paris's own daughter and the Putnam's daughter, and the Putnam's are like the biggest landowners and the richest people in town. Um, and they think that they have the most power because they have the, they're the most money. We're still doing that now in our, in our culture now. Um, these two girls are sick. Um, they're faking. They're so nervous and they're so afraid that they're going to get in trouble for having been caught dancing in the woods the night before that they're both pretending to be sick. Now, it does bear to note that in the 17th century, as well as previous, many previous centuries, the culture, the religion, absolutely believed in the presence of witches and the devil. I'm going to have to, that's my daughter chiming in here. I'm going to decline. She wants to FaceTime me. I'm going to have to call her back. I can't make it go away. Um, what was I saying? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so, um, so the girls are faking and they absolutely knew uh, the signs of witchcraft and the things that, that, that they're very Christ, that they're, they're very Christian, like witch fearing, devil fearing culture would think would be signs of the devil and of witchcraft. Anyway, so they take the whole town on this kind of journey and Abigail realizes that they could be in a lot of trouble because they did this little incantation in the woods and they did dance in the woods in the middle of the night in the first place and that could get them whipped, etc. And um, through a series of events, Abigail realizes that if she lies and says that she absolutely saw the devil, that she's not going to be getting in trouble. That if she blames Tichuba the slave for conjuring the, the devil and for, for bringing evil into their town, that she's going to be able to not get in trouble. And she convinces the other girls who are afraid of getting in trouble and they're afraid of Abigail, she convinces them to go along with the lie. Except Mary Warren, who our friend here, Amy Marshall Furman, played in the play. And Mary says to the very scary Judge, judge Hathorne and um, the other judges that, that the girls are lying and they start to believe her um reverend uh, uh, john proctor believes her absolutely because he knows abigail to be kind of you know shady and a little outside of 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 morality and because of what he knows about her because they had an affair and the girls at, led by abigail turn on mary and now they're convincing the judge the judges who had been starting to see that people were falsely confessing 
to being accused of witchcraft for a variety of reasons. You know, they covet their neighbor's house or they covet their neighbor's land because it's closer to the river or they have a problem with um, so-and-so sold them a pig and after they got the pig, the pig died. And like, there's all sorts of reasons why people would be mad at each other or harbor guilt or resentment or um, anger or whatever. And, and the whole town started pointing fingers. Oh, so-and-so is a witch and so-and-so is a witch and so-and-so is a witch because they're following suit on what G Abby did and realizing that the judges believe them hook, line and sinker about all of this. Um, and so we find like half the town is in jail and the other half of the town is like scared to death to say anything or very glad that the people that they put in jail are still in jail because they seem to be winning at life, even though they're, you know, amoral, unethical slimes. And so the story continues and we're talking about um, reputation and we're talking about a love of God and um, fidelity towards one's spouse and one's community and one's um, religious beliefs. And we're talking about lying and fear and what fear makes us do when we are um, obeying the fear when we are uh, giving in to our more base impulses in this life um, and and turning in our friends and so on and and every time I read the play every time I experience it with students and we talk about all of the different ways that humanity has done this exact thing on itself over and over and over again um, I, I get to teach or show or lead these kids to seeing that as humans, as one human race, I hate to use the word race, but, but we suck. You know, we, we have not learned anything. We are still doing it now in 2020. We are divisive. We are name calling and, oh, hi, Brianna. I love you too. I'm so glad you found me. Um, we are, we are still doing the same things to each other. You know, we don't like each other's political beliefs. So instead of being open-minded and listening and realizing that we have more in common than we have differences, instead we allow our differences to divide us by color, by, by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by sexual orientation, by political view, um, by geography, by, by money, by financial, by, by what like you know, class levels we think we're in. We allow all of these external things to divide us up and make us separate each other into factions and divisiveness. And it's not getting us anywhere. It didn't get us anywhere in the 1620s or the 1690s. It didn't get us where in the 1950s. It's not getting us anywhere now. Um, truth be told, in, during World War II, um, we were still doing this with the Nazis. I, I was talking about a few weeks ago. I was talking about Alice Hoffman's book, The Dove Keepers, and we, it was it was the same thing then. And that was before. That was the, the second. To the fall of the second temple of Jerusalem, which was, you know, like 60 years after Christ or something, like 2,000 years ago, and we were still divisive and pointing fingers and after each other um, because of religion and, and social class and money and power. And I, I think humanity has sort of outlived its, its purpose on earth to a degree, because we're clearly not learning anything. Um, in some respects, we're better, but in so many respects, we are no more, we are no better off than we were 2000 years ago. Um, we have to stop being divisive and pointing fingers at each other. We have to stop being afraid of what's different or being afraid of change. We have to stop ruining relationships and ruining families over the most ridiculous things and realize that selfishness and that being out only for our own good or our own family's good at the at the expense of somebody else and someone else's family and someone else's rights and someone else's health care and someone else's whatever isn't going to get us anywhere as a community. We must stick together. We must help provide for the common good and behave in ways that is good for our entire community, not just us. And 
I, I hope we can find our way out of this because right now our selfishness as, as a global society is ruining our environment. It's causing horrible climate change, which is ruining the habitats and ruining the environment for countless species of animals and plant life and fish and, and, and humanity. We are going to start very quickly seeing climate change migrants and, and refugees uh, that no country is going to want to take in because of their own selfishness. And uh, I, I, my heart breaks. My heart just breaks. I lose sleep every night because of these monumental problems that we can't seem to do anything about, that we can't seem to get out of the way of and improve. Like even just something simple like health care. Some people feel like, you know, they work hard for a living and they deserve better health care and someone else who might work just as hard but not make enough as much money is less somehow less deserving that someone else's child born in poverty is less deserving of a good pediatrician and immunizations and good food and healthy drinking water and how is it okay for my kid and not okay for that other kid why is it okay that we have children and families separated at the border right now and children in cages i i i, I just I don't know what to do. I write letters to my senators and my congressmen on the local and, and state and federal level and I send money and I, and, I, and I talk to my students about these things every year and um, I, don't, I don't know what else to do. And I, we need to band together and we need to keep talking about these things in, in a productive, non-judgmental, accepting, non-selfish, community supportive way um we have some more comments coming in brianna i've literally been trying to go to salem for three years but something always comes up but i've been trying to go because you made me love the play oh that's wonderful um nina my daughter actually works in salem there's a little mall and she works at the barnes and noble that's right in salem and uh and as i said in the beginning of this little broadcast is taking a a class on the salem witch trials um in her college in beverly massachusetts which is only three and a half miles away from Salem. Um, it's so cute. The town is wonderful. We went up, uh, so she's a junior now. So two years ago when she was a freshman, my husband, Michael and I went up to school for a parents weekend or the weekend after parents weekend, cause it's too crowded when parents are there. Um, and we, we, while there were all of these, um, uh, activities that didn't pertain to us, we went into Salem when we went to a couple of witchcraft museums and we saw, a uh, performance and we went into the museum that's there and it was it's such a beautiful cute little town um and now brianna you can't go because of this pandemic i don't really necessarily think interstate travel is all that safe but maybe by next year or the year after we'll have a vaccine or something and it maybe it'll be safer to go but it's it's really cute it's a really cute town. And Amy says that if anyone wants to read the play, it's great. It's great. You can watch the movie. Reading a play by yourself is kind of weird, but you know, if you're a dork like me, you might do it with friends, you know, English teachers. What can I tell you? Um, but the movie with Winona Ryder and Daniel Day-Lewis is phenomenal. They also have um, actors who have who read it on audiobooks. I downloaded from Audible, and you could probably get it from your local library through Libby. Um, the app that you can put on your phone that connects to your um, ebooks and iBooks for loan through your public library. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, you can get all sorts of stuff. But I, I've also listened to an audio version that way where it's read by, ooh, banged into microphone, where it's read by different actors. Um, if you Google online, there are links to free versions of it that are read by different actors too which is interesting to to watch so you could do it as an audiobook while you're cleaning or driving or whatever um, but it's a great play and it never goes out of style unfortunately because um, i mean fortunately for those of us who love the play but unfortunately for humanity we still keep repeating these things anyway so that's my book talk sunday thank you for uh for joining me um i did have some exciting news on the permission to land front. Um, as of this month, both books, the memoir, Permission to Land, Searching for Love, Home and Belonging, and the companion journal, Permission to Land, Personal Transformation Through Writing, they're both available in person in the bookstore 
at um, Huntington's wonderful, beloved um, um, independent bookstore, The Book Review, right in the heart of Huntington Village. So on the local and independent authors page, both books are available. Um, they're also available on my website, marcybrockman.com, and they're available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and iBooks and Powell's and almost every single other place um, that you could find online. Um, right now through September 15th on my website, marcybrockman.com forward slash hashtag books, you can buy both the memoir and the companion journal for 20% off plus shipping and handling. Um, so you can save money. So for less than the cost of just, uh, for less than the cost of the hardcover, you can get the paperback, both paperback versions. Um, so that, that's cool, but you only have until the 15th to do that. Um, and today is the 13th, so there's two more days. Um, so hopefully you do that, marcybrockman.com um, or more specifically marcybrock, marcybrockman.com forward slash hashtag books. Um, so that's it. I um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday and the rest of your weekend. Please take care of yourselves. Find some time to rest and relax and recharge because come tomorrow morning, we are facing another busy work week. No rest for the weary or some rest for the weary on, on a weekend. So thanks for joining us uh, or joining me. Um, I'm Marcy Brockman and this has been another Book Talk Sunday on What's Up Marcy. Thanks so much.